Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Vessalatu vesselam ala seyyidina ve nebiyyina ve habibi gulubina ve şefi'i zunubina Ebil Qasimi Muhammed Allahümme salli ala Muhammed ve ala Muhammed ve acil faraca ve ala lehil masumin el muntecebin el tayyibin el tahirin الحمد لله الذي جعلني من المتمسكين بولاية أمير المؤمنين عليه السلام قال إمام الصادق على إن للجنة ثمانية أبواب ثلاثة منها إلى قوم First, I send my salams to Mawlana Sahib al-Asr al-Zaman, and secondly, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa It is amongst the mustahabbat, the most recommended is reciting salawat, and it's especially recommended on the eve of Jum'ah, the eve of Friday, and the day of Friday. Ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa ajjil Inshallah, Allah light our hearts with the nur, with the light of the iman and ma'rifah of the Prophet of Rasulullah and of the Ahlul Bayt. We are commemorating the month of the Qa'adatul Haram, which is a month that give us, gives us many reminders of one ma'asum in particular. If we were to name each of the 12 months after one of the Imams, the month of the Qa'adah would be named certainly after Imam Ali ibn Musa Rida alayhi salatu wa salam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa ajjil farajah. The first of this month is the waladat of his beloved sister Fatima al-Ma'asuma sallallahu the 11th is the birthday of the Imam, the 8th Imam himself, Ali ibn Musa Rida. The 23rd, according to some narrations, anyways, is in the Mafatih of Sheikh Abbas, that the 23rd is the Shahadat of Imam Rida. And the last day of the month is the Shahadat of his son, the 9th Imam, Imam Muhammad al Jawad, alayhi salatu wa salam. Allah, Muhammad wa Muhammad wa Muhammad wa May Allah grant us and give us the opportunity and make us deserving of all of their intercession. The month of Ziqa'da is a haram month. And we know from the Quran that there are four months that are haram. There are four months. The month of Rajab is a haram month that is, stands alone. And then the month of Ziqa'da, the Hajja, and Muharram al-Haram are three consecutive haram months. And these haram months are such that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made qital and jadal haram in these months, that you cannot go to war. Even if you are at war with a kafir al-harbi, with a kafir who has the, is bloodthirsty for the Muslims, who is coming after you, it is obligatory unto you as a Muslim, whatever you can do to cause a ceasefire to bring about some sort of a peace treaty, albeit temporarily. This is the importance of these months, of the Haram months. And they existed before Islam, the time of Jahiliyyah, and afterward in the Qur'an, Allah confirms this as an Islamic tradition. Now the wisdom behind this is uh, rather obvious, that when you give a group of people who are fighting a month, or in this case three consecutive months, of peace, that they cannot go at each other's throats the way they have been, then they're going to sit back and they're going to think about it. They're going to think about the costs of war, the benefits of the peace, and ways and means to go about it. It would be really beautiful if we had this tradition in the modern world, if the United Nations had some sort of charter or something like that. Um, back then, 
uh, even the Jahil Arabs observed this. So the Muslims were fighting the Jahils against the, these people. They were, they were really mindful of these Haram months. Now we might call this an intermittent period. These Haram months are times where you are distracted from what you have been doing. There's a disruption, essentially, in that trend, in that trajectory of fighting, of war. And this is something that we see in Islam extending even on the individual basis. And I'll give you an example. The month of Ramadan, which is not a, one of the four haram months, the month of Ramadan is a time where the believer is thrown off a trajectory of bad habits if they have fallen into it the rest of the year. So the believing person, perhaps they've gone wrong, they've done bad things throughout the year, they've developed bad habits, all of a sudden the month of Ramadan falls smack in the middle of all your plans, disrupts everything, and you put back on track again. Now sometimes it might happen that you fall back again and you become that old person after the month of Ramadan. Oftentimes, however, you have learned and you have seen that it's actually possible. Sometimes when we do not avoid sin, we don't avoid haram, it's because we don't even think it's possible. It looks so big to us. It looks like this mountain of of tasks that you have to accomplish. And we have this intermittent period like the month of Ramadan, then you realize, no, wow, I, I just did it. I did this. I could, if I did it for that period, I could do it as I should all of the time. Also, we have other intermittent periods like this in our lifetime. And the more of these that we have, the more protected we are from ghafla. Ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa ala So we have the notion of tawbah, of repentance. And if we are truly going to follow the Ahlul Bayt's recommendations, then we're going to repent on a daily basis. We're going to take stock of our actions every single night. You're going to sit down and say, okay, I woke up this morning, these are the transactions that I had. These are the people I met, these are the plans that I made. And every night you have this disruption, this intermittent thing, where you might be planning to do something haram. Now some of the haram acts that people commit, they require previous planning. Somebody comes and they invite you to a haram gathering three days away, four days away. You're going to plan what you're going to wear, you're going to try to clear your schedule, all of these things. But if you have this intermittent process in your lifetime, that every night you're taking stock of what you're doing, it'll break that trajectory and it'll set you on a different path. This is the power of these recommendations that Allah has. We have yearly intermittent disrupting things. We have things that on, the, on a daily basis. Perhaps the most powerful of them is salat, is praying on time. Which is why it is stated that the person who avoids salat, who their salat becomes a qaza on purpose, they see the sun is going down, or they see that the sun is rising, and they don't pray that that person is considered outside the folds of Islam. Salat is essential for being a Muslim. It's at the core, the center, the pillar of faith. If someone is performing salat, and I, I might have mentioned this before, the narration has it that a young man came into the masjid, and the companions complained to Rasulullah, said this man is going to wrong places, and he, and he shows his face at the masjid. And Rasulullah said, leave them alone, mind your own business. So long as he's performing his salat on time as he is, then this man is going to be protected from those sins. That there is nothing, that eventually he's going to either lose the salat, or he's going to lose that sin. Ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa ajjil. Now I bring this up because we are ourselves in a time of calm, relative calm, and none of us are engaged in harab in a physical warfare or any sort of thing like that, and this is a time of opportunity. We have to look at these intermittent periods, these times as times of opportunity, not just of staying away from what's bad, but actually doing something positive as well. There was years ago when I was in high school, I overheard a conversation from an African-American woman who uh, was from a certain class and uh, had this misfortune of a, being part of a certain culture that we all are familiar with. Her son had never been to prison, and her daughter is 18 years old, and she'd never been pregnant. And she was boasting about this, that I'm proud of my kids, I have good kids. 
and she's focusing really on what's bad. Is, is they're not doing anything bad at, 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 in my book. But what about the college that they're going to go to? What about their education? About their future? All of these things, anything positive? And this is something that we can apply to, to the deen, to the religion as well. It's not just about avoiding, avoiding, abstaining from sin. That is the foundation. The foundation is that you're not on drugs. And then after that, you can build on, on yourself. The foundation is that you've avoided, you've learned to stay away from those things. And then you start building on those things. We're in a time that there's much work to be done, much building to do. This past week, or a couple of weeks, you guys are all aware of the uh, protests that have been going on across the world in regard to those, that, that movie that uh, is meant to mock Rasulullah. And of course we condemn the movie, but I don't know what we can say about those protests really, whether they're doing damage or whether they're doing good. Some of them are necessary, of course, but a lot of the times they're, they're extreme. People are getting killed. There's signs, and these are infiltrators from the Wahhabis, of course. There's signs saying, behead those who uh, disrespect Islam and stuff like that. It just, it scares me, let alone someone who had never even come in contact with these people. And there's a lot of work to do in this regard. If we look at uh, corporations, business, businesses, um, in the United States especially, the job of the departments that advertise is to create an image for these corporations, to create a brand and a culture for them. So if we look at, say, the iPhone, and I'll, and I'll <coughs> tell you how this is related. If you look at the iPhone, it's a tool with a lot of functions and features. But beyond that, it also associates itself with a whole culture, with all these themes, these ideas, with a whole class of society. And Apple has done a very good job at creating a culture around their products. Religions are very, very similar. If you ask somebody who's not a Buddhist, for example, what they think of the Buddha, the idea of the Buddha, and many of us here might even have these same answers. What do you think of the Buddha? What comes to mind? They will tell you, you know, when I think of the Buddha, peace, meditation, tranquility, wisdom, philosophy, a whole series of words and phrases and themes that are associated with this character. That's, that, that's a brand. That's what corporations try to do. They try to have a whole series of associated themes and concepts. If you ask about the personality of Jesus, it's not just religion, but even personalities. Of Jesus, alayhi salatu wassalam, what's associated with him? People will tell you similar answers. Peace, love, humanity, caring for your neighbor, all of these things, these are terms and phrases that are associated with Jesus Now all of us have a job to do and we should lower our heads when we consider the question, what would people say when they're asked about Hazrat Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa ajjil farajah. It burns the heart that he who is rahmatun lil alameen, who has the largest of hearts, <clears throat> who cared for humankind like no other human ever created, who is the best of creation, is going to have an image in the world such as it is made out for him today. I don't think the big problem right now is that they insulted Rasulullah. Rasulullah, if he were around, he wouldn't be insulted himself personally. The big problem is that they are giving this brand to Rasulullah, to Islam. They are telling the world that this is what Islam stands for. And when I say I don't know what to think of those protesters, it's because they're not helping either. With those angry faces and threatening language that they have on those placards. This is really something that we have an opportunity. It's a time that we should work on this. Allah Muhammad wa Muhammad sallallahu Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Muhammad wa ajjil Of course it requires that we equip ourselves with knowledge and the right tools. And there are few people, unfortunately, who have the right knowledge and right tools to do this. And few of those, even fewer, actually take up the cause to raise the banner of Rasulullah, to mention his name, to give quotes about him from the from the. Um, I was actually this past week. I was driving an uh, an NPR radio. They were talking about something. The radio was low. I wasn't listening, and all of a sudden, 
I hear, I'm like, what is this? I turn it up. The, the interviewer asks the person and says, uh, for whatever political movement he was involved in, he said, would you do everything that you have done so far if you knew of the consequences and the hardships that you have on your path? And what caught my attention is the interviewers said, the interviewee said that, uh, yes, and in the words of Ali ibn al Hussein, and my eyes just became wide, like, what is he saying? In the words of Ali ibn al Hussein, if I died 1,000 times and came back to life again, I would still go and pursue this. And this is something, I don't even remember what the conversation was about, honestly. But what's important is that he's quoting the Ahlul Bayt in a context that might not even be related. If you look at, say, someone like Einstein, people are quoting him all over the place. Just go on your Facebook, you have some friend quoting Einstein right now, saying you know, what, what he said about wisdom and what it takes to accomplish things and whatnot. It's not about physics, it's about general things that we all understand and we all care about. Does the Rasulullah, does Amir al-Mu'mineen have few of these things in Natural Balagha? That we can't quote them outside of the context to make them popular names, to give them this kind of brand that people can learn and associate various concepts with? Why do people know so much about the Buddha? All of these secular textbooks, if you look in the humanities, have quotes from the Buddha all over the place. Why don't they have quotes from Hassan al-Mushtaba, from Imam Hussein? It's because we ourselves never quote them. We, we quote them here in the masjid to each other if we do that. But in general society, find the opportunity. Of course, it requires that we learn it. We know what they say about different things. And that we quote them even if it is out of context. I think that's absolutely important. Amongst the uh, Imam Zadis that we have, these children of the... Ahlul Bayt, of the Imams, there are few who stood for Walayat in particular the way that did only a handful of them. There's a handful of the Imam Zadis that we know very, very well because of how they stood for Walayat, no matter where they were. And this is really the point I'm trying to drive home, that we have to stand above and beyond others in our, in our communities and in our societies. One of them is none other than Abdul Fazl Abbas alayhi salatu wassalam, the son of Amir al-Mu'mineen, and we read in the ziyarat, Ashhadu annaka, ashhadu annaka bil taslim wa tasdeeq wa al-wafa'i wa al-nasiha, when it's talking about Abdul Fazl Abbas, that he is somebody that the Imam al-Ma'asum is saying about him, that you're someone who stood for the Ahlul Bayt, who gave everything you had for the children of for Amir al muminin for Hassan and for Hussein. Allah Muhammad wa Allah Muhammad Allah Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa ajjil Another one of these individuals is known as Shah Abdul Azim al Hassani. This is from the line of Imam Hassan al Mushtaba. And today he is buried in Ray, the city of modern day Tehran. And Imam Hadi says, Marhaban Bikum, Haqqa. This is an Imam Ma'asum telling this non Ma'asum individual, saying, Antawaliyuna Haqqa, truly you are our follower. You're really our follower. You stand out beyond everybody else. Now we have narration that visiting him is not less than visiting Abi Abdullah in Karbala. If you go to Ray and to Shah Al-Azim and you open the Ziyarat book that he has, this is what it says about him. Why? Because he stood for Walayat above others. The other Imam Zadis have shrines and they are respected and we go and do Ziyarat and it's recommended, but there's some of them that really stand out above and beyond the rest of them. And another one that I want to say a few words about tonight it's Hadrat Fatima to the Mahasuma, Salahullah, Allah Muhammad, Allah Muhammad, Allah Muhammad, Allah Muhammad, Allah Muhammad, There is very little that we know about her, unfortunately. She passed away at the age of 28, and for the period that she was in Medina, we don't really have anything recorded from her. And the period that she was in Qom was very brief. It was a very short time that she was in Qom. 
But from what we have, we see that a great percentage of it is talking about wilayat, of talking about the status of Amir al-Mu'mineen. There's a reason why Qom is, is very sincere and, and passionate about these things. From the beginning they were, and after they had Ma'asuma there, it magnified things a lot more. There's a narration in the book of Al-Qadir from Allama Amini, in the first volume, that says, An Fatima bint Musa ibn Ja'far. It's narrating from Fatima, the daughter of Imam Ja'far. An Fatima bint Ja'far and Asada, from Fatima, the daughter of Ja'far and Asada. And as we move along this chain, you realize that whenever the Imams had daughters, they named them Fatima. This is a train, chain, and it is referred to as Fawatim. There's a couple of hadiths like this, narrations like this, that are referred to as Fawatim, because the chain is all Fatima. And Fatima, so it goes on, the daughter of Imam Baghir, Fatima, the daughter of Imam Sajjad, Fatima, the daughter of Imam Hussein, Umm al kulthum and then from Fatima, bint Amir al-Mu'mineen, sallallahu alayha, and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Wow, ma salla ala Muhammad wa alayhi Muhammad wa ajjil faraj. So the Prophet of God says, Ya Ali, O Ali, anta minni bi manzilat Harun min Musa. That, oh Ali, you are to me, your station to me is that of the station of Aaron to Moses. Meaning that, Ali, you are my vicegerent. You are the wali of the people. Another similar narration, again from Hazrat Ma'asuma, says very closely the same thing. That a group of Christians, again this is a, one of the fawatim, came to Rasulullah and they said, Oh Muhammad, who is going to be your successor after you? And he says, he gives them signs and is none other than Amir al mumini This is the type of thing that Abu Fatima al Ma'asuma focused on, is Walaya. This is why her station, one of the reasons that her station has risen so high. Qala Imam Sadiq alayhi salam, ala, inna lil jannah thamaniyatu abwab. That paradise, in this narration from Imam Sadiq, he says, paradise has eight gates, has eight doors, which is an interesting conversation on, on, on its own, that it has eight doors and hell is said to have seven doors. And there was one scholar, I just mentioned this in brief, he spent an entire month of Ramadan talking about paradise, about heaven and the gates and how the size of heaven and that there's an angel that Allah sent to measure the size of heaven and after a while Allah says you've only measured the station of a single moment, of a single believer. It's so vast and so large and compared to the hellfire. And uh, somebody asked at the end of 30 days of lectures on paradise, you know, Maulana, why don't you talk about hell? You know, balance it out a little bit. He says, I'm going to say this. You guys can go and experience that for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> but inshallah, it is, it's not this way. Um, but the vastness of paradise, all of this is, is there. And importantly, the Imam says, Thalathatun minha ila qom. There's eight gates to paradise. Three of them, this is a very high percentage, three of them are from qom. I mean, the people of qom, there's so many of them, they occupy three doors on their own. Which means that these people, what they are doing, their culture, their way of life, there's something about it that makes them heavenly. There's something about this place that makes them heavenly. It's something that we can learn from these people. The ways that they are doing it is working. Three gates from eight are given, are designated for the people of Qom alone. And then the rest of it are distributed amongst other people. If you look at other narrations about the people of Qom, especially when you talk about the end times, Akhar zaman again the proportions of the companions of Wali al-Asr are so high from the city of Qom. It's an amazing place. And I'll speed a few narrations about the city of Qom with a loud salawat. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad wa ajjil farajah. Fiha mawza'u Jibra'il alayhi salam, says in one narration. That this is the station, this is the place where Jibra'il alayhi salat wa salam would visit. We don't know when it's talking about what part of history, but there's a time that Jibra'il would frequent Qom quite often. 
another narration said that the people of Qom, there's just as much emphasis on the people of Qom as there is on the city of Qom. That the people of Qom are people who are Yabulumun, who rise in revolution for Sahib al Zaman. This is why it's called Qom. It comes from that same root word. That they are Yabulumun. And even today, if you go in the Islamic Republic, the city of Qom is known as the city of Khun Qiyam. The city of revolution, of rising. Of course, we know that the revolution of Ruhullah al Khomeini started from Qom. The sparks of it were from Qom. They're the ones who rose up. And we know that today this is the center of Shia Islam. There's no place more dear to us right now for Shia Islam than Qom. All of the Maraja, with a few exceptions, are in Qom. Qom is the center of Shia knowledge. The Hawza is in Qom. It's a very amazing place. Another narration that says why the city of Qom is called Qom, it says that Rasulullah on the night of Mi'raj, when he was ascending to paradise, he looked down and he saw Shaytan al rajim in a barren land, and Rasulullah said to him, Qom fasharik fi a'da'ahim, means rise, get up, and go join the enemies of these people. But you don't have anything to do with these people of Qom. Fasharik al a'da'ahim, go and join the enemies of the people of Qom. Qom is, is, is sacred, it is sanctified from these people. Another narration goes that إِذَا أَمَّتِ الْبُلْدَانَ الْفِتْحَنْ فَعَلَيْكُمْ بِقُمْ وَحَوَالِيهَا وَنَوَاخِيهَا فَإِنَّ الْبَلَايَا مَدْفُوعَةٌ أَنْهَا That it says that the city of Qom at the end of times, when everywhere is overcome with corruption, that Imam Salib was saying, when all these places are overcome with, with corruption, فَعَلَيْكُمْ بِقُمْ Unto you, I advise you, go to Qom. Why go to Qom? Because it will be safe from the fitan, from all of from the balaya of the fitan that are in the Akhara Zaman. From all the calamities that can befall you in Akhara Zaman, Qom is guaranteed to be safe. Akhara Zaman, this best place to live, is Qom. Allah Muhammad wa Muhammad Salam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Muhammad wa ajjil farajah. And of course, the biggest benefit there and we'll end is Fatima al Ma'asuma and her ziyara. Her ziyara is said that if you want to do ziyara of Fatima al Zahra, go to do, do ziyara of Fatima al Ma'asuma. This is the station that she has at home. If we would see how the Ma'rajat go crazy when they go to visit the shrine and they do ziyara, then we would really realize the station of Fatima al Ma'asuma. Very, very high and very lofty in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us, even though we are far from the city of Qom, from the people of Qom, but to grant us a mindset and a proximity, albeit in our hearts, to Qom, to the city of Qom, to the people, and to Fatima al Ma'asuma. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us on the day that we will need it. The shafa'a of Fatima to al-Ma'asuma. نسألك اللهم وندعوك باسمك العظيم العظام العزل جل الأكرام إلهي بحق محمد وعلي مفاطمة والحسن والحسين يا الله 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 اللهم اغفر والدينا ولوالدي والدينا وارحم موتانا واغفر ذنوبنا وخطايانا وانصر اخواننا واحفظ قائدنا واجل فرج مولانا صاحب نصر الزمان السلام عليك يا فاطمة المعصومة 
سلام الله عليك وعلى أبيك وعلى أخيك سهن سرايا شهرم مرتزا مسجد بالا سرش کر بداس آینایش همه عباسی است رنگ و لعاب حرم عباسی است این که Allah, 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 Allah,